Paul Rani uh, is a professor and chair of the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering at the University of Southern California. He received his bachelor degree from UC Berkeley and his master's from Caltech and his doctorate degree from aeronautics and astronautics from MIT. He held postdoctoral appointments at the NASA Lewis Research Center and the US Naval Research Laboratory and a position as assistant professor at Princeton University before assuming his current position. Uh, he was also a payload specialist astronaut for space shuttle mission STS-83 and 94 in 1997 and has flown experiments on three space shuttle missions. He is a fellow of ASME and the Combustion Institute, an associate fellow of AIAA, and the recipient of the National Science Foundation Presidential Young Investigator Award. Paul has published over 80 technical papers in peer-reviewed journals, made 250 technical presentations, and holds seven U.S. patents. Uh, Professor Ronnie's talk today is on releasing insights from data, coring versus sculpting. And I'm going to let you guys know, everyone watching, that he'll be delivering a talk in an interactive format. So just put your questions in the Q&A, and I'll do my best to uh, relay them to Paul. All right, thanks, Joe. Actually, don't put your questions uh, in the chat. Put your answers in the chat. As I say, I want this to be interactive uh, in the sense that, you know, there's nothing more boring than for me to speak for an hour. And by the way, I want to introduce my uh, newest research assistant behind me, Cavalier. Yes, I do uh, most of my um, lecturing for my classes as well as most of my meetings from the barn over here. It's a nice place to get away from home. We're about three miles from home. And uh, although uh, it's been quite smoky here, we're near some of the fires. We're actually quite close to them. And on top of everything else, we had an earthquake last night. So it's official 2020 stinks but anyway i appreciate this opportunity to speak with you and again i want to make this seminar a little bit different than uh, most of those seminars you're seeing in this series i want to make this interactive it's aimed more at the graduate students uh, than the faculty because i want you to develop some to help you maybe develop some skills in terms of not just acquiring data and presenting data but also interpreting data hence the title uh, releasing insights from data. Okay, so outline. Uh, first, thing I'm going to talk a bit about Michelangelo. You say, what does that have to do with uh, combustion? You'll see. And I'll give you a couple of examples where people found unusual results. Maybe they weren't really that important, but there was some enormously important underlying meaning to it, both one the classic uh, hydrogen atom spectra, uh, as well as one closer to our hearts, namely the explosion limits of hydrogen oxygen systems. And then I'll give some examples from, uh, from my own work. And these are, like I say, are challenges to the student. You don't know the answers to these. Um, uh, the first two have not even been published yet. So, and I wanna get you used to this idea of thinking about, you know, not just collecting your data, but what does it really mean? So here you have a block of marble. You and I always see as a block of marble. Okay, hit advance. This is what uh, Michelangelo saw. I've heard it said that when Michelangelo looked at a block of marble, he didn't just see the, the block of marble, he already saw the figure inside, you know, and all he had to do was release the figure that in his own mind was already there. Of course, his figure didn't have the little Trojan there strategically placed, but I thought for the purpose of the seminar, I should add that. Okay, um, so now this is something that all of you have seen. This is the three explosion limits. But what's important is not this block of marble, but what, what is the hidden meaning underneath it? So, so this is the hidden meaning. This is what, what all that means. And we'll, get to the, we'll get back to this in just a minute. But again, I want you to get used to the idea of thinking about, you know, not just seeing those blocks of marbles, but finding the figure inside that block. So the first example I'm gonna use, and this is one that's familiar to all of you, is the hydrogen atom spectra that um, around 1885, it was shown by Balmer that, uh, you know, just, I don't know why he did this in the first place. Heating up a tube filled with hydrogen, he saw that the emission spectra of hydrogen was not continuous. It was composed of discrete lines, which, you know, in itself you say is not that important a result, but uh, it, it said something very profound. And it wasn't, you know, it wasn't until some time later that people realized what it really meant was that the energy states of matter are quantized. That they're not continuous. You would just expect to see some sort of continuous spectra, uh, but it wasn't. And again, this led to, of course, the development of quantum mechanics, 
uh, and the, uh, all the, the various um, uh, probability density functions of uh, an electron surrounding a proton, as you see on the right there. So again, tremendous amount of meaning in a seemingly innocuous experiment that you might otherwise say, oh, who cares, I got some lines, so what? There's very profound underlying meaning. Now, just to remind you, what we do with the, uh, to generate the three explosion limits of hydrogen to measure them, you basically start out with uh, an evacuated vessel, and you have a separate vessel where you have the hydrogen-oxygen mixture. The evacuated vessel is heated, and at time equals zero, you open a valve, flow the mixture quickly into the heated vessel, and then you see whether the resulting reaction is sort of slow and continuous, or it's a rapid explosion. And then you plot the boundary between explosive and non-explosive as a function of the temperature and pressure of the gas in the chamber. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, or two things to keep in mind, one is that the rate at which the, you can heat the material inside the vessel, as well as the rate at which you can lose heat and lose active species to the walls is proportional to the diffusivity of the mixture, which in turn is inversely proportional to pressure. So thus the reaction time and thus the explosion time increases as the size of the vessel increases. Again, because the diffusi both diffusivities are inversely proportional to pressure. And then there's also wall effects, which then cause not only to lose heat, but also active radicals. Now, you know you're gonna lose heat, but maybe at the beginning, you didn't know there were gonna be any active radicals. But anyway, let's go to the next slide and you'll see what this result was. So here are the three explosion limits of hydrogen. You've all seen this picture from Lewis on Valve's text, uh, text and it's been reproduced many times in many forms. And again, you could just look at this as a block of marble, but there's a tremendous amount of hidden meaning in it. Now, normally you expect that the reaction rates well, you expect that they increase with both temperature and pressure, which means a contour of equal reactivity must, notice mo must is in quotes, must have a negative slope on a uh, temperature pressure diagram. And, but you see that the so-called second limit, it slopes the wrong way. And so why is that? And then why is there a separate uh, first and third limit and the second limit sort of, you know, uh, spans them, but but it slopes the wrong way. Now, for it, this tells you many things, and uh, you know I think we in the combustion community don't necessarily do a good job of explaining to the students what the fundamental importance of this is. But it really shows unequivocally, this couldn't be a purely thermal system. You wouldn't have any reason to have the the wrong sloping part of the curve, and the fact that there's a first and third limit that are widely separated says that there must be. In addition to it's not a thermally controlled system, it must be a chemically controlled system. It also tells you that there must be two different sets of active species. The one at the first limit that is very active, uh, but at high enough pressures, it is somehow suppressed by something. We now know that that's due to the, uh, primarily due to the uh, reaction H plus O2 plus M, where M is any third body, any other molecule, forming an HO2. Now, when you're just above the second limit, those HO2 molecules, they will have time to diffuse to the wall on a time scale shorter than they can react. And then, uh, then the, at the wall, they recombine with other HO2s and uh, form uh, H2 and O2 again, the stable species. However, at the third limit, then you have other reactions happening, particularly two HO2s combining to form an H2O2 hydrogen peroxide and an oxygen, the oxygen doesn't do anything, but then the H2O2 uh, can then split because the, o, the OO bond, a uh, single bond is quite weak. And so then that can split and form two OHs, which is another chain branching route. So in both cases, you have the ability to either uh, promote chain branching or to lose it. Uh, at the uh, first limit, or sorry, this, above the second limit, you lose it because HO2 is, to, is a very stable species and it takes the H atom out of the system. And then above the third limit, that becomes active again through a completely different route. So to me, this is like the block of marble and it's up to us to understand what's, what's inside. And what's inside is what I've said here, that it's not thermal, there must be two active sets of intermediates. And it says that uh, there must be inhibiting step for the active species 
that are dominant near the first limit uh, that has a, a, a stronger pressure dependence than the reactions that generate the active species. In this case, of course, we know that's H plus O2 plus M, which uh, increases as pressure cubed, versus H plus O2 going to OH plus O, which increases at a rate proportional to pressure squared. So then one other thing I, I thought about was, well, let's take a look at, how can, can I reproduce that curve? Uh, what does it take to reproduce that curve? And so I found that I could reproduce it just using a simple, uh, the online chemistry calculator at uh, Colorado State, David Dandy's uh, website, and just say, well, what's the time scale for, say, 50% conversion of the hydrogen oxygen mixture to water? Uh, and here's the key point. If you don't do this, it doesn't work at all, is that you make the time that you allow proportional to pressure because the time is, or the pressure is proportional to the time it takes, uh, that it takes radicals to diffuse to the wall and then recombine with other radicals and, uh, and back into neutral species. So if you do that, if you take that and then you, know, you just by sort of tweaking one constant to say, what time constant do you use at one atmosphere or some other pressure, and then just use scale the uh, uh, time constant up or down with pressure, you find you can reproduce the curve very well. And of course, as we now know, that basically that second limit occurs near the point where there's a crossover in the rates between the, the branching and the recombination step uh, for H plus O2. So again, I think we have a pretty good understanding of this part of the curve. So this was a case where, you know, by taking that block of marble, namely that squiggly curve, we could gain a tremendous amount of meaning from it and learn something that, uh, uh, that uh, Semenov and Hinshelwood won the Nobel Prize for, for work they did back in the 1930s. But those are things that you knew. Now let's talk about some things that you don't know. This work hasn't been published. It's not even combustion per se, but it's close. It's chemically reacting flow. It was pointed out to me that we had, we had found in our experiments uh, on uh, low temperature combustion at small scales in our so-called Swiss roll combustor, we could actually burn propane or butane at temperatures as low as 75 C by using a combination of heat recirculation. And the key point was with an ammonia treated catalyst, we discovered quite by accident uh, a way of treating platinum catalyst with ammonia that greatly enhanced its low temperature performance. So someone pointed out to me, hey, combustion just a shorted fuel cell. If you can burn propane at 75 C, could you make a proton exchange membrane fuel cell that operates at about that temperature, but uses hydrocarbons directly rather than hydrogen or methanol? The advantage being we can store hydrocarbons, you know, like butane in particular, uh, in a tank at two and a half atmospheres. Same reason you use it in a Bic lighter, is that you can store it at low pressure, but when you expose it to ambient pressure, then <clears throat> it becomes a gas. So it's very convenient much more convenient than hydrogen. All the ways that without going into it here, by f other than cryogenically, by far the best way to store hydrogen is to attach the hydrogen atoms to carbon atoms and make hydrocarbons. Even if you're not gonna use the carbon as fuel, that's still the most weight efficient way of storing hydrogen. So we wanna say, well, can we make a proton exchange membrane fuel cell that uses directly uses propane or butane rather than hydrogen or methanol? Of course, we don't have any expertise in um, fuel cells, but we're working with a great chemist, Surya Prakash, uh, in our Department of Chemistry, and using, like say, ammonia-treated catalyst with the standard Nafion uh, polymer electrolyte membrane, and just using a very standard fuel cell testing setup, as I show here. Okay, go ahead. Okay, and we find that it works. Okay. Well, it did it first. And I've, I've structured these slides, so I'm not giving away the punchline. At one point, I'm gonna ask you for ideas as to what's happening. Okay, so it worked at first. Uh, and the power that we get is much lower than you would get from hydrogen, but okay, we're getting power. We're not trying to compete with uh, internal combustion at large scales as like the Toyota Mirai uh, automobile does with it uses a hydrogen fuel cell. I'm trying to compete against batteries at small scales. And so that's a much easier competition to enter into. So you can see we're getting, you know, um, 
we're getting tens of milliwatts per square centimeter, whereas with hydrogen, like we in the same fuel cell, we get hundreds of milliwatts. Okay, but something very weird happens. Something very weird is happening here. Notice that what's you can see here, what's happening is that the fuel cell works for an extended period of time, and then suddenly it stops. It just suddenly extinguishes. If we are at high currents, relatively high currents, at lower currents, it operates continuously. So there's like some sort of extinction process going on here. So how could that be? This sounds like a flame, right? Do we not know all about extinction processes for flames? Well, this is, and that's typically thermally driven. This is not thermally driven because the ex entire experiment is done isothermally at a constant temperature that we control. So it's not a thermal effect that's occurring here. And it only occurs at high current densities, not at low current densities. So then <laughs> this is one of those things drove us nuts for months because all of a sudden our fuel cell didn't work anymore. It turned out that my PhD student had switched from one tank of propane to another tank. Now, as it turns out, in hindsight, it was kind of a bad idea, but it was fortuitously a good idea because he had been using CP grade propane, which is not that pure. It's only 99.5% pure, and you don't know what the other half percent might be. It might be all propane, or it might be something else. There's no guarantee one way or the other. So when we went back to the original tank, then it started working again. And after analyzing what was in the, the first tank that wasn't in the second tank, it's unsaturated hydrocarbons. Uh, without going into the, uh, all the results here, we found that ethylene was the best for this purpose. Ethylene was a great, uh, first of all, if you have very pure propane, the fuel cell will not start at all. It does not work, period. If you add a little bit of ethylene, just a puff of ethylene, then it ignites the cell and then it, and it runs. And it'll keep running, as you can see, if we add more than about 2,000 parts per million of ethylene, then it will just run continuously. If I shut off the flow of ethylene, keep the flow of propane, it'll run for a while, but then it'll suddenly extinguish, as you see here. Notice I keep saying suddenly. It's not just a simple exponential decay to extinction, it's an abrupt extinction, and that's gonna be very important. That's, that's a very big clue. That's, that's the figure inside the marble, or I should say that is the block of marble. There's a very important figure inside because it, because it drops off very rapidly once it starts to drop off. Okay, notice that the time there is on a log scale. Well, I guess it's actually hidden there, but you can see that the, the, um, the horizontal axis is time. Notice on it's a log scale. So it's taking thousands or some cases even, well, uh, tens of thousands of seconds before it suddenly extinguishes. And so I ask myself, how many times is each individual platinum site being used before we reach this extinction condition? So with a gas absorption technique, we can determine about how many active platinum sites we have. And by knowing the current, we know how many, uh, and knowing that at most, each uh, propane molecule produces 20 electrons if it's converted completely to carbon dioxide and water. We can determine then how many times each platinum site was used. It turns out that that number is as much as 10,000 times. In other words, 10,000 propane molecules interacted with each platinum site and nothing happened. Then on the 10,000 first time, something happened and that, and all of a sudden the cell extinguishes. We also found that if we just momentarily, and my, you know, when I first, my student first uh, explained what was happening to me, I asked, well, how, what do you have to do then once the cell extinguishes, what do you have to do to restart it again? And, and, and he said, oh, I don't have to do anything. I just have to shut off the current to the cell and turn it back on. I said, what? Yeah, that's all. So we found actually by doing what we called load interrupt operation, that is by simply uh, cycling the current off for a few, like five seconds out of every 30, the cell will not extinguish. And the average power we can get as you can see in the figure on the right, the average power we can get is much higher than we could get if we insisted on operating steady state. So this is kind of strange. Uh, one th other thing that we looked at is what's in the exhaust of the fuel cell. We looked at the exhaust and found nothing other than unburnt fuel and carbon dioxide and water. That's it. There were no, there's no hydrogen, no carbon dioxide, 
no intermediate hydrocarbons, nothing. Just either unreacted fuel, carbon dioxide, water. Uh, and also, I don't show the results here, but all unsaturated hydrocarbons we tested, basically propane and butane and isobutane, behaved exactly the same way. And we did not see this with any other fuel other than unsaturated hydrocarbons, uh, either dimethyl ether or hydrogen. Again, don't see anything like this. We started out with a model. What could be causing this? And so the first hypothesis was, let's, say, let's assume that we have, that the, the fuel cell has two types of sites. On, this is on the anode side, the fuel site. Either they're active or they're inactive. And it's binary, there's no in-between or half-active sites. And furthermore, let's assume, I think reasonably, that the fuel cell power will be proportional to the number of active sites. Anyway, I just assumed a first order rate equation. That's a, the, the sign there in the middle is supposed to be then implies then, uh, arrow pointing to the right, uh, <clears throat> that, uh, that the rate at which active sites form, or the rate at which, um, so these would actually be reversed, I see. But basically, the rate at which inactive sites revert back to, um, the rate at which inactive sites revert back to active sites is just proportional to the number of inactive sites. Furthermore, we assume that the rate of conversion of active sites to inactive sites is proportional to the number of active sites. You know, just very standard stuff that we see in uh, chemical kinetics. And so you can combine those and say, well, does that lead to extinction? And the answer is absolutely not. Because you reach an equilibrium concentration of active sites where the forward rate and the reverse rate are equal, there's no way to get an abrupt extinction or even an exponential decay to, to, zero, uh, uh, to, to zero power. So there's no abrupt extinction. So this is where I'd like the students to get involved or the, or the grown-ups. What's missing from this? Any ideas? I sort of have three, uh, you know, three topics here, but if we don't get to the third one, that's fine. I'd really want the students to say, what's missing in here? What can cause that abrupt extinction? There's one thing missing from this formula here, or from this analysis, that, as I'll show, matches the experiments beautifully. Think about from combustion, what causes abrupt extinction? How do we get, you know, like flames, once they start to extinguish, you, you know how we have all the, um, the S-shaped curves, you start to get, you know, a weakening of the flame, reaction rate drops because of the temperature drop, and because of the exponential effect of uh, temperature and reaction rate, it drops more, and then pretty soon you fall off the cliff. Now, this is a, not a therm Do you have a uh, quenching of the site or the uh, active site quenching? Yes, in a way. No, I like say a, a good idea is heat loss, but in this case, the system is isothermal intentionally. Yeah, no, you, you, you yeah, I know that. I, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, yeah, now there, there's um, the sidewall, because basically it's a, it's a, basically a flat surface, and there, there isn't that much edge area. You don't, you don't need to consider any edge effects for this to occur. So what happens, and this happens as we, it, only for higher current densities, that is more trying to process more propane molecules per unit time. Yeah, so the membrane limitation is not considered here. Yeah, it turns out the membrane Saturated. is not a limitation because with exactly the same fuel cell, we can get easily 10 or 20 times more power if we use hydrogen as the fuel. So the membrane, yeah, so the proton conductivity is, is not the limiting factor. It is a limiting factor when using hydrogen, but not when using uh, propane because you have so, much, so many fewer protons per unit time going through the, the membrane. So intermediates, that's a good thought. Um, it's not, not quite. You're kind of on the right track. We don't, you know, we don't, uh, let's see. So yeah, there, it's a nonlinearity. You're, you're on the right track now. It's a nonlinearity. But what is that nonlinearity? Obviously, I mean, that's a good point. Obviously, I have to have a nonlinearity in order to get uh, abrupt extinction, right? Because otherwise, I just have exponential decays. Lo local. Uh loss of uh, reactants. Now, I, don't, I don't need that. Like I say, I don't need any loss per se. Multi-body effect, yep, you're on the right track. Is there something about the buildup of products that changes the operation of the active sites? 
you're getting very close. What it turns out is there must be, you think about it, the only way to get self-acceleration is if the number of inactive sites increases with the number of already existing inactive sites. So I added an extra K3 term, where now the rate of conversion of active sites to inactive sites is proportional not only by a K2 to the number of active sites, but also is proportional to the number of inactive sites, already existing inactive sites. You know, that sounds kind of weird. So now the, the product of the reaction is now a catalyst of the reaction. This is what you call an auto, auto catalytic system that we have a lot of experience with in other uh, domains. Although in this case, the auto catalyst is going to cause the whole cell to extinguish. And so I had an extra term. I didn't know what exponent to use on that. You can use almost any exponent, even one will do, but it, uh, if you use B equals one, lowercase b equals one, it gives a very slow extinction. If you use B equals two, uh, then you wind up with this equation. So you have the, the rate of production of active site, uh, or the rate of loss of inactive sites is proportional active site squared. So A, B, and C, some of them are positive and some of them are negative. Now you look at this, the nice, the, the real, cool part about using B equals two in this case is it has an exact solution. Anyway, the, the exact form is important. You see, it's kind of a, a mess. There's a lot of algebra involved, but it has an exact solution. And the, the exact solution has um, there's three different cases, basically depending on whether uh, the, the value of the determinant, which really then in turn depend, tells you whether you're going to go to extinction or you're just going to reach a steady state. So for the first case, which basically corresponds to a large uh, K1, which basically, me, uh, which basically means a large current. This is where the key point is. The rate at which active sites are converted into inactive sites, I assumed was in some way proportional to the current, which makes sense. If I'm using more sites, I'm going to be creating more inactive sites. Uh, for the second and third cases, I'll reach an equilibrium if I start with enough initially uh, enough initial active sites, uh, I'll reach a steady state equilibrium eventually. Otherwise, it will just go to extinction if I start with too few active sites. And this, I can't, don't have time to go into the details here, but this can exactly explain the load interrupt mode of operation. So again, the nice thing, it has an exact solution. And let's compare the exact solution to the experiments. So the top two cases are for, you know, a large a larger value of current, basically, or a smaller value of current. Notice the similarity between the, um, the exact analytical solution and the experimental results. Notice they're both on log scales. Time is, is on log scales in both cases. Uh, but you see, again, if I just use the number of active sites as a measure of the power production, they look extremely similar. Notice they even have the same little wiggles in them. And again, for larger current, it leads eventually to extinction. For smaller current, it decays to a steady state. So I think we're, I, I have to believe we're on the right track here. But now let's try one more thing. What did that tell you? How can, how can that be? How can these seemingly independent inactive sites, how can the number of, the rate at which inactive sites form be proportional to the number of already existing inactive sites. I can only think of one way that could happen. Again, I don't want to take too much time here, but let's see, can anybody explain how can the number of inactive sites, the rate at which inactive sites are formed, be proportional to the number of already existing inactive sites? Somehow they're not independent of each other. We normally think of like in chemical kinetics as you know the rate, the possibility of two molecules colliding and reacting as being independent of these other two molecules over here, whether they react or when they collide. But that's not happening here. It's different here. An idea would be causing that. So Paul, if you have a uh, intermediate species that are generated through that active size. And that yeah. product can diffuse to other side and occupy the other side and make it inactive. Possibly, but I think there's a there's an even simpler explanation: water flooding. Um, that this the 
the, the cell, I didn't mention this, but the, both streams, the oxidizer and fuel streams are humidified. So basically the membrane itself is actually already fully saturated. So I think we're, and you know, the way that the cell is set up, the water, if any liquid water forms, it does uh, drain readily. So I don't think that would be it. Also, I don't, that, I don't think that would cause such a rapid extinction. But these are all good ideas. We have a question in the Q&A. Okay, are sure. Are less active sites, so they, uh, so they are poisoned at a higher rate? <clears throat> yeah, the, the active sites, or the inactive sites, sort of get poisoned at a higher rate than the inactive sites. Although you could say that the inactive sites are already poisoned in some way. What is it? Okay, well, let's move on. Because again, I do at least want to get to the second topic. So the only thing I can think of is that new inactive sites preferentially form next to e existing inactive sites, right? So if I have an inactive site here, and if I, if, if, if I have active sites here, this is inactive sites, how can they know whether there's an active site here? That, that you know, the rate of formation of new inactive sites shouldn't depend on the number of already existing inactive sites, unless, unless the probability of a new inactive site forming is proportional to the number, or it forms preferentially next to an existing inactive site. That's the only thing I can think of. I suppose, to my knowledge, we don't, there isn't a very, there isn't much diffusion, you know, on the surface of these sites. Uh, I don't think it would occur nearly as fast. Once the extinction starts to occur, it happens very rapidly on fuel cell time scales. So I don't think that's it. So what I thought about was, okay, maybe what happens is that some sort of polymer chains form. I get a sort of a polymer chain forming and then those spread out and then rapidly then sort of cover the surface of the fuel cell with, uh, with inactive sites. They're inactive just because the sort of a polymer of some kind is formed on the anode, which would explain the benefit of the unsaturated hydrocarbons because they're good at terminating polymer chains. So I thought, aha, we've got it. But then, so we looked in our effluent for either dimers or larger molecules uh, in both the gas and the liquid effluent. Didn't find anything, nothing. There's no higher hydrocarbons at all in them. And working with our chemist friend, I think we did a good job of looking for them. Uh, so that's where we are right now. So I thought we, I, you know, I thought I'd be able to close the, the book on this, but there's this one in open, one open question is, why is it? Is it because inactive sites form preferentially next to existing inactive sites, or is there something else? I think that's it, but then what is it that's forming? Why does one inactive site breed more inactive sites? So the conclusions of this part is that fuel cell extinction, you know, I think is, if you compare the analytical solution to the experiments, I think it's safe to say that the fuel cell extinction caused by the conversion of active to inactive sites, again, only happens with hydrocarbons, not with uh, the ethers or, um, or uh, hydrogen. Something is causing the rate of conversion of active sites to inactive sites to increase with the already existing fraction of active sites, which makes me think, yeah, so CO poisoning, um, yeah, we try, we could, this fuel cell actually will run on CO. Yeah, we could, if we flow, well, it works with CO, believe it or not. Yeah, it doesn't, you don't get that much power, but CO, believe it or not, CO even prevents the abrupt extinction. Yeah, I didn't show those results here, but yeah, we have tested CO as a fuel and it works as a fuel, not very well, not much power, but it does actually work as a fuel. And you can actually even start the cell by flowing, the hydrocarbon by itself will not start, flow a little CO or an FCO, it, it will start the cell and then you can stop the flow of CO. You might say, well, why don't I just use the uh, unsaturated hydrocarbon, the ethylene, as my fuel? That must be better. And the answer is no, it's not. The, uns the, uns the saturated hydrocarbon is a better fuel, produces more power than the ethylene, the unsaturated hydrocarbon. The unsaturated hydrocarbon won't extinguish, but it produces less power. So you might say, wait, there's an optimum then. The optimum is about 2,000 parts per million of unsaturated hydrocarbon with the, hydro with the unsaturated hydrocarbon with the balance being the saturated hydrocarbon gives us the most power. Interesting, huh? Um, so the other thing is it doesn't happens at high power levels, high current levels, which means that the reverse reaction is also occurring. And that is occurring at a constant rate that is not dependent 
on the current, or at least it has a lower, de weaker dependence on current. Otherwise, you couldn't restore the cell. So you see, there's a lot of there's a lot of statues inside this block of marble, only some of which I've completely revealed. There's one question. Sure. Uh, what change to the flow composition do more inactive sites cause? Oh, yeah. Again, I didn't show that. But we, we did a we did an experiment where we basically start the cell, operate it, then we shut off both the um, shut off both the uh, intake and exhaust, and just let whatever is in the cell react until the cell extinguishes. And what we found is that there's nothing in the exhaust other than carbon dioxide and water and unreacted fuel. There's nothing else. There's no CO, there's no intermediate hydrocarbons, nothing. Which actually makes sense in the context of what we do from combustion, because at these low temperatures, all the intermediates, they can't get off of the, they can't get off of the, um, off of the platinum at those temperatures. The activation energy for desorption of CO and hydrogen and OH and all these other things uh, is just too high compared to the activation energy for desorption of CO2 and water for this cell to uh, uh, to release them. Yeah, so we don't we don't get anything coming off the cell except the final product. And I didn't also didn't show it here, but we also found that what is the, the propane that is reacted reacts completely. We basically get 20 electrons per propane molecule consumed. We're not, leaving, we're not leaving anything on the table, which is very promising then. I don't think we're gonna get a lot of power, but we can get very good fuel utilization on this, which might be useful for portable power devices, which is our real application to try to replace batteries with portable power devices. Paul, I have okay. uh, one question. Sure. Uh, did you try the same chain length in the unsaturated hydrocarbons as the saturated hydrocarbons? Maybe it's yes. just the, the size of the molecule. Yeah, we, we did. We also did like propylene and um, even acetylene. And you now that it turns out ethylene was the best, uh, the, the best promoter, but they all worked in a similar way. Yeah, any, any entrepreneurship? Not yet. We're working on that. So at least want to get. To, obviously, won't get to the second one or the third one. Okay, um, I want to call it novel velocimetry. So, quite by accident, I don't, I don't even want to go into what we were looking for at the time. But we quite accidentally found in a Taylor Coet flow, which is where you have an inner cylinder and an outer cylinder, and you look in the flow in the annulus between the two cylinders. And in this case, we were just rotating the outer cylinder. You can see. On the left side of your screen is the inner cylinder. Okay, um, what happened? What happens is that you'll see a wave of fluorescence moving from right to left, from the side where, where we started the flow, you know, over towards the uh, other side of the annulus. So this is so this is weird. What we're saying is that now it looks like the rate whether fluorescence occurs or not. This is just using our standard disodium fluorescein, nothing fancy, uh, but we happen to have sodium dithionite for, again, for a completely different reason. Uh, sodium dithionite is one of the uh, chemicals in the mixture, which is a very strong reducing agent. And basically you get no fluorescence until you start the cylinder. And then you'll see a wave of fluorescence propagate across the uh, cylinder gap from right to left, which immediately made me think we had found a shear rate sensitive fluorescent indicator, which is sort of like what you have, you know, let, let's get what bioluminescence, you know, in microorganisms is, is that. I thought we had found, we discovered something like that. And if the motion stops, the fluorescence stops again. But what we found is that you didn't have to have any shear at all. If you just took the whole cell and shifted the entire cell a little bit, then the fluorescence would appear again for a second or two, and then it stops again. So it's the displacement, not the shear, that causes it. Okay, so this is, this is where another one of those things that was driving us nuts. Another experiment that we did, where is take a sheet of laser light, and you see it's been expanded, so you see the Gaussian profile, so the intensity is highest in the middle, uh, in this solution of water plus fluorescein plus sodium dithionite. And 
you see that you get this like wave of fluorescence, like a propagating front of fluorescence. They say, what could be causing this? Um, and you can see that it's advancing. Okay, so now what could be causing this? Now keep in mind for fluorescence, two things have to happen. The first one is that you have to absorb, you have to absorb a photon. The fluorescent molecule has to absorb a photon. And second, it has to emit it. And for fluorescein, it, it absorbs in the blue and it emits in the green. You're only seeing the fluorescence here, not the uh, excitation beam. Okay, so what could be causing this? So the thing is, this is with a fairly high concentration of fluorescein. So basically the laser beam is, atten the laser sheet is attenuated, basically blocked because of all the absorption. But then somehow what was absorbing becomes unabsorbing. And then the beam can travel further through the mixture and then cause fluorescence in the next layer of, yeah, it is a saturation phenomenon. But it's not the normal type of saturation. It's sort of a saturation, not of the fluorescence, but of the absorption. Bleaching. Oh, there it is. Bob Dibble knows. This is a bleaching process. It's a very weird type of pho photo bleaching. That's why I didn't use the title. At first, I was using the title photo bleaching velocimetry, which is exactly what it is. But I didn't want to use that because then I'm giving away uh, the answer up front. So another th experiment that we did is we have uh, this solution flowing down a pipe, laminar flow, Reynolds number less than 2000. And you can see that as the velocity increases, this, these are bulk velocities, as they increase, the fluorescence intensity increases. So again, how can that be? And you see the lower figure is a plot, you know, of the effect of, uh, of the effect of the bulk flow velocity as a function, or the effect of bulk flow velocity on the intensity. And we see a distance in the downstream, in the, um, in the axial direction along the center line. Okay, so what does all this mean? So, so clearly you can see that the fluorescence intensity data, this is our block of marble. It contains information, it contains information about velocity, but why, how does it do that? But Bob Dibble had the answer, it's photo bleaching. So the first hint is the advancing wave of fluorescence demonstrates that the loss of fluorescence is not due to the loss of the ability of the molecule to, to fluoresce, it's because it doesn't absorb. Because if it's still absorbed, then it would just, you would see that the, um, the fluorescence would just stop at one location. But now you actually photo bleach the the absorption process, not the emission process. Okay, so a little bit of background. It was already well known, and this has been used for years in the, um, in, in the microbiology literature. People have used sodium dithionite as a bleaching agent, you know, so they can trace, um, you know, they can tag fluorescent molecules onto cells and see what happens to them. What was not known was that the inhibition of absorption does not occur just by adding the, the dithionite. It only occurs after you expose the mixture of dithionite plus fluorescein to light. It doesn't occur, it doesn't become you know, un, uh, un, non-fluorescent or non-absorbent in the dark. Uh, and the other thing was not known is that as I'll show in a minute, that with exposure to light, the inhibition of absorption is a kinetically controlled process. As a side note, we found the photo, it's not really relevant to the discussion, so I won't go into it here. But the other thing we found is this type of photo bleaching is reversible. If you wait on a time scale of tens of minutes, the process reverses and you can use the solution again. Unlike normal photo bleaching, in which case, you know, you destroy the molecule and it can never uh, fluoresce again. Also we found, and this drove us nuts, was we got inconsistent results until we realized that oxygen reacts very rapidly with dithionite. Dithionite is a very strong reducing agent. 
and so it interacts with the uh, oxygen. So you have to use water that has been, I never would have thought of, you think of, of distilled water as distilled water, right? It's not. It has dissolved oxygen in it. And that just completely destroys the dithionite. Or if you just expose the solution to air, then you start to see a wave of, you know, a wave of fluorescence start to appear as, as you in, uninhibited the photobleaching. So we found that we had to do this in an enclosed environment free of air and also bubble nitrogen through the solutions before we started in order to uh, expel all of the oxygen from the dissolved in the, uh, in the water. What we discovered is a new type of photobleaching velocimetry, as I said, normally at very high intensity lights. Even in some cases, some people have done this photobleaching and all they're doing is heating up the molecules, believe it or not. They're heating up enough to destroy them. At, and so if you do this with this high intensity light, then at low velocity, the molecules spend a lot of time in the uh, volume where the uh, laser is, and so they get photo bleached. If they go through quickly, there's not enough time. And so that's how photo bleaching velocimetry works. It's not a common technique, but it is used. And so in that case, again, you know, that the light intensity is related to the speed. The higher the intensity, that means the faster it went through, the less photo bleaching occurred. Uh, but like I say, normally this photo bleaching destroys the fluorescent molecule and requires very high laser power. Our type is a completely different type. So, okay, so the first step in quantifying this was to determine, you know, just like any good uh, combustion researcher would, let's find out the kinetics of the reaction. So we found that if you, you start with an unbleached solution and then expose it to argon ion laser light, that you'll see over time, the intensity of the fluorescence will decrease. And it turned out it's, a very, it's just a simple exponential decay. And we could fit it, you know, just again to a standard exponential decay with a time constant omega, you know, from a least square fit. So this works out pretty nicely. So we found that this was, which is very convenient. We found it was first order the, in fluorescein concentration, first order in dithionite concentration, uh, first order in the intensity of the, uh, of the probe beam. Okay, so that makes life easier. So now we're gonna create a model. I mean, because of the time, I won't go into the details of this, but basically it's first order and everything that's, that is gonna affect the result. There is an analysis we can do uh, that considers the time history as it's going through like a Gaussian shaped beam, Gaussian profile in beam intensity, as it goes through that, and including the kinetic data of bleaching that we just showed, where that the intensity even for a fixed composition, the rate of bleaching is proportional to the intensity of the light uh, and the effect, again, of the Gaussian-like beam intensity. And so the success or not of this to quantify it would be if we can use one rate constant for varying velocity profiles, varying compositions, uh, varying beam intensities, et cetera, uh, in laminar pi flows. So I just showed the results for differing velocities and comparing, you know, with one single rate constant, which turns out to be 0.02, the units are inverse seconds times some constant that's proportional to the uh, laser fluence. And does that one constant then reproduce all the experimental data? And you see actually it does quite well. So for different velocities and different distances along the uh, the path of the bleaching as the molecules go through the Gaussian beam and they start getting a little bit photo bleach, more photo bleach, more photo bleach, and then less and less and less. And we can match the profiles very well. So this gives us a new way of doing um, velocimetry in, uh, you know, in aqueous solutions in a way that's A, requires very low laser power and B, is reversible. So I get a big tank of this and you know, use it over and over again. Only the uh, reverse uh, bleaching takes on the order of 10 minutes. But again, I won't get into that here. So again, it's another case where the data was screaming something at us, but it took us a long time to figure out what it was actually trying to tell us. You know, I'm no Michelangelo. You know, I just see a block of marble. I kind of eventually saw, oh yeah, there's a figure in there. 
Okay, so the third one was on something that was actually combustion, you know, on edge flames. And basically I showed that we had some very unusual effects with edge flames. Uh, and most of you from, or I think are familiar with the term edge flame. We found some very unusual results where methane behaved one way and higher hydrocarbons behaved a completely different way. And not only that, N-butane versus isobutane behave completely differently. So again, there's a lot of meaning in there, but, um, but since we're actually a little past uh, 10 o'clock or 11 o'clock your time, 8 o'clock my time, we'll just skip over that. Okay, so let me go to my concluding slide. What I want to get across, particularly to the, uh, to the uh, students here, that data are not just false color pictures of something or squiggly lines in a plot. There are hidden meanings that are just begging, demanding to be released, like Michelangelo and his block of marble. And basically the weirder the result, the more hidden meaning is there for you to discover. So pay more attention to your weirder results than your expected results. After all, virtually all great scientific discoveries, I'm not saying any of these are, but all great scientific discoveries were basically the result of an accident. You were doing something, expecting to get one result, and you got something different, and that led to no understanding. I'm sure that when Balmer heated up his tube of hydrogen, he was expecting to see a continuous spectra, but yet he saw something entirely different, and him and, and others then realized that that was extremely significant and eventually led to the development of quantum mechanics. So also, it's very important that you turn only one knob at a time. Like what we did, like if you go from, since I didn't have time to go through it, I'll just give you a very quick summary, that comparing methane to butane, you're actually changing two things. One, you're changing the Lewis number. Butane is a bigger molecule. And so you have, um, and so you have a lower, uh, high, sorry, higher Lewis number, lower diffusivity of the fuel molecule. So, but if you just went from, methane to butane, you've changed both the Lewis number as well as the chemistry. Say, but aha, I have two forms, I have two isomers of butane, n-butane and isobutane, that n-butane has a much lower octane number, so to speak, meaning that it decomposes much more readily than isobutane. And so we found completely different results with n-butane, which decomposed readily, versus isobutane, which did not. In fact, the n-butane decomposes readily into smaller products, which have a lower Lewis number and behave more like methane, whereas isobutane does not decompose as readily, and so it behaves like a mixture with a higher Lewis number. And so bottom line is, you know, don't accept those results, you know, that, that I think particularly examples like the free explosion limits of, hydro, of um, hydrogen, we tend to sort of nod and smile you know, because that's what was published in Lewis and Lunel so many years ago. But there's actually a lot of hidden meaning, a lot of good results. And imagine, put, put yourself in the position of you're the first person ever to derive that plot, or the first one ever to measure those data and draw that plot. Now it's up to you to decide what does it mean, not just to quarry the block of marble, but to decide on the meaning that's inside. So finally, I'd like to thank, of course, Yi Guang and Wen Ting Sung for organizing, uh, Sun for uh, organizing the seminar series, and Joe for moderating this one. Uh, uh, there are too many students to name. I just mentioned the ones here that worked on the uh, the uh, projects that I showed in uh, this work, and of course our sponsors, AFOSR, NASA, and NSF, and this patient and interactive. I wasn't sure if they were going to be interactive, but you have been very interactive. Sorry, I didn't have time to address all the questions. And of course, behind me, my uh, executive research assistant, uh, uh, Cavalier, for being so patient. All right, and thank you all for your attention. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, I think we will make a little bit of time for a few questions. I have uh, two so far, but mm -hmm. feel free to keep posting them. Uh, the first one is from uh, Pang Zhao. He asks, uh, if the extinction is induced by the conversion from active species to inactive ones. Mm -hmm. Active what if, sites to inactive sites. Okay. Yeah, but okay, go ahead. All right. 
what is the behavior of the same mechanism in an H2 PEM? And how, uh, is this how this mechanism is kinetically affected by unsaturated hydrocarbons? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So the answer is it isn't. You never form with hydrogen, also with um, dimethyl ether, we tried that. Uh, neither of them produce any, um, neither of them produce any sort of extinction in any way. One thing we haven't tried is how much hydrogen could added to, um, added to the hydrocarbon could suppress, could suppress the um, extinction, which would actually be a good experiment in hindsight, because then that tells me, is it really a chain termination, as I'm suspecting, that it's the unsaturated hydrocarbons that then suppress this extinction? So hydrogen wouldn't be able to do that. So if, it, if my theory, if my hypothesis is correct, of course, if you add hydrogen, you get more power, but you wouldn't suppress the extinction mechanism. So, but the bottom line is, no, with, 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 if you're just using hydrogen fuel by itself or um, dimethyl ether, well, and also people have used methanol, same thing, you don't see any of this behavior. It just, you start it up and it runs. It's just very weird to see a fuel cell suddenly extinguish when it's not like the temperature, it's not like the temperature dropped off or anything like that. And like I say, even, even carbon monoxide works as a fuel. Not very well, but it does work. All right, we have a, a second question regarding the photo bleaching uh, experiment. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the time constant and what is the fastest velocities you can measure? Okay, so you can see that the bleaching time constant, or this is inverse seconds. So take one over that to generate a time constant. And you see that they're on the order of 10 seconds or one tenth of a second or one twentieth of a second. So, real, so then what it really depends on then is there's a trade off between the size of your measurement volume uh, and the flow you want to measure. So, you need to have the product of the, of the flow of the um, velocity you want to measure. Let me get this right. The, 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 width of your probe volume divided by the velocity you want to measure, that gives you a time, that is units of time, and that has to be comparable to one over the bleaching rate. So if you're willing to accept a larger probe volume, then you can go to higher uh, velocities. If you want a very small measurement volume, then you need uh, to limit yourself to lower velocities. So if, say if you want, to, let's just say is a typical, uh, if you want the laser beams, you know, or maybe let's say a couple millimeters in diameter, you can measure velocities up to maybe on the order of 20 centimeters per second. So it's not really useful for very high speed measurements with high resolution. So it's not going to compete with, let's say, PIB, something like that. But for low velocities, you see, now I can, with a very simple thing, all you need is, you know, sodium dithionite and fluorescein and, you know, any argon ion or uh, diode laser that emits in the uh, blue, you know, and then I'm done. Okay, well then uh, I'll thank our speaker. Thank you, Paul. That was a, a really nice and a very uh, different talk. I, I, I really uh, enjoyed thinking on every slide. So I appreciate yeah. it. Paul, thank you for agreeing to give us a lecture. Uh, you are continuing you for the to be very uh, innovative and uh, creative. And, uh, and the talk is very yeah, impressive as well. And uh, thank you. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, this is our horse here, Cavalier. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. Uh, he, he was just fed. The reason he wasn't very interested in this talk is just because uh, he was just fed just a couple minutes before, uh, uh, before the uh, seminar started. So I'd rather have his breakfast than, uh, uh, than watch the, uh, the talk. Yeah, he probably learned something, see through the marble and see Michelangelo's uh, statues maybe. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's he's my, you know, executive research assistant. You know, I'm also uh, now chair of the department uh, of aerospace and mechanical engineering. So he's my executive vice chair. He's also <laughs> an honorary member. I teach a freshman class. He's an honorary member of the uh, class of 2024. Okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, now you see. Can you come over here, Pamela? <laughs>